special day. And this is a day for all of us dads. This is where I want to get pretty serious and ask you to open your minds and ask you to open your hearts. And also praying that the Holy Spirit convicts us. That the Holy Spirit really convicts us. To the point that we would be willing to change. So this is a day for all of us dads to step up and demonstrate that serving God, going to church with our families, and being men of God is important. How many would agree it's important? Those who were with us last Sunday, if you were here last Sunday, will remember how we felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in both of our services. I believe with all of my heart that God is stirring our hearts today. And I believe, quite honestly, that we're on the verge of a tremendous spiritual renewal, the likes that we have never seen before. I sense it. I feel it. God is, God is working, and he's stirring, and he's moving uh, our hearts. And I think there's a deep conviction that's beginning to set in. And I think that we're being stirred to move toward and enter into a deeper walk with God, a closer relationship, and a deeper fellowship with him. And I hope that you're open to that, and I hope that you're seeking that, and I hope that you will understand the need for that, especially in the day in which we're living. So may each day say, you know, Lord, let it begin in me. Let this spiritual renewal actually begin in me. May that be your prayer, Dad, because after all, if you understand the Scripture and have known the Scripture, you will understand that you are the head of your house. God made you the head of your household. You are his chosen vessel to lead your family. I see a lot of nominal Christians today. And I see a lot of families that are torn up. I see kids that are in trouble. I see kids that are rebelling. And I hear the cry of dads and moms alike. And I I see a lot of people... I see a lot of people who profess to be Christians and yet only attend church once in a while, finding better things to do on Sunday than to go to church. So, first of all, this morning, dads, turn around. Look who's following you. Dads, you want your children to grow up well. I know you do. I can't help but feel that you want what's best for your children and your grandkids. You want your children to succeed and to make it. Then you yourself need to give your life to Jesus Christ completely. You need to be committed to be a follower of Christ first and foremost. And so maybe today, maybe in a new way, you would dedicate yourself to make God the head of your household and the head of your life. Give yourself to attending church. Give yourself to a commitment to serving and following Jesus Christ. If you do that, if you, if you do that you, and walk this out and play this out in front of your children in the love of Jesus, you just, you just see what God is going to do in their lives. I just believe with all of my heart that it's gonna, it would make a difference if you really live a Christ-like life in front of your children, those who are following you and are looking to you. Turn around, Dad. Turn around and look at who's following you. Secondly, turn around, Dad, and look at the church. The church is you. The church is your family. The church is you and your children. And if church is important to you, it's going to be important to your children. I'm so thankful for a father who made me go to church. As a teenage boy, you know, teenagers, we want to do other things. We'd rather be home playing ball or run up down the street, whatever. But my father said, it's church time, son. We're going to church. Out of respect for my father, even though I went sometimes with a bad attitude, my father made me go to church. And I'm thankful for that today. I'm thankful today that as I look back on it now, you know, as a kid growing up, you don't think about it. You you can't really see that far in the future. 
But I was so thankful as a kid that I learned how to turn on light switches and flush toilets and carry tables and chairs and mop floors. For me, you know, if I wanted to get home early, I had to do that because that's what my dad was going to do. He was the first one to church to make sure the church was lit, thermostats were on, lights were on, tables and chairs were set up, and he was the last one to leave to turn the lights off, flush the toilets, mop the baptistry floor after baptismal services, prepare the communion for communion services as my father. I learned how to do those things as a deacon's boy long before I ever became a pastor and still doing those things today. I look back over that and I say, thank God that I learned to serve first and for a father who taught me. So dads, you know, if church is important to you, it's going to be important to your kids. If prayer is important to you, it's going to be important to your kids. If your language is clean, Dad, with void of obscenities, you see, your children pick up on the words that you use and the words that you say. If you drink alcohol, you can bet your kids are going to drink too. Because you see, after all, if, they, if it's okay with you, then if it's okay with Dad, then it's going to be okay with me. What you do, they will do. Turn around, Dad. And look at who's following you. Turn around and look at your legacy. See the kind of testimony that you have because your testimony is going to be played out in your children's lives. You can see it in the life of your children. So turn around and look behind you and see what God is doing with your testimony as you look to the lives of your children. Someone said to me a long time ago, and I've never forgotten it, you'll never know how successful you are as a father until your children grow up and leave home. You may think your child or your stepchild is not watching, but I'm telling you, Dad, don't be fooled for one minute because they're watching. And they pick up on what you do and what you say. They believe for themselves and in themselves the things that you say to them and about them they will believe. I will tell you a story to prove this point. Next month I'll be 68 years old and I'll never ever forget the day when my father said this to me. He started smoking when he was about 12 years old. He smoked till he was 51 when he first had his three bypasses and he quit smoking then. But back in the day when he smoked, you know, he had this flashlight. He was really proud of this flashlight. And I was just a little boy, just a young boy, and it had a cigarette lighter in it. And he was just really proud of that. He could flip the thing and light his cigarette. And had, he said, I don't know, he just thought it was cool. Well, you know how kids are and how boys are. One evening I took the flashlight out and I was playing with it in the backyard, you know, and then I just set it down on, on a little box outside the back porch and then I went off, you know, and did other things. And, and then the day came when my dad said, I wonder where my, I can't find my flashlight. I wonder where my flashlight is. And I go, oh, no. I went outside on the back porch and pulled it out of that wood crate, and it had rained on it, and it turned rusty. And like I say, I was just a little guy, and I had some birthday money. Back in those days, somebody give you a dollar or whatever. I always got a dollar from my grandparents. And so my dad, when I took it to him and showed him, I, he was so disappointed and seeing this disappointment on him, and he became upset with me that I said, well, Dad, you know what? I can help buy another one. I'll buy another one for you. I got a dollar and some cents. And you know what my father said? He said, no, you don't have any cents. I will tell you this, dads. The things that you say to your kids can become believable for them. The next time they make a mistake or they fail or they fall or they do something wrong or whatever, they'll say, well, I had it coming to me because my father always said I was stupid or my father said this about me or he said that about me or he said I didn't have any sense, so I'm just living up to what my father says I am because this is what he believes about me. How many of you ever heard the saying, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never harm you? That's a lie. Because <laughs> words hurt. And words stick with us. 
Will you agree with me this morning? Words stick. And sometimes they become believable because we look up to our fathers, we look up to our moms, and if they say that about me, and if they believe that about me, then, then it must be so. Words you speak, words both of love, words of encouragement, words of kindness, but also words of sarcasm and condensation will never be forgotten. And if anything, as I look at these texts this morning, if anything, Paul is saying that our children should be raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we are a letter that our kids are reading, that our children are reading about us. And so many of our kids look up to us in a way that, boy, I'd like to be like him someday. And I, I think the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, Dad, Hey, parent, you are to walk before your children in a manner that is worthy of being called a Christian. And so then, may we as dads be able to say, I'm going to bring up my child in the circle and the circumference of the Lord and of the church. I'm the one that should live in such a way as, as they would want my Savior. You know, we profess to be Christians, but are we living in such a way before our children that they want the Savior that we say we serve? Do we live in such a way before our kids that they want to be Dad, we are to guide their little feet all the way to heaven. I found a prayer, and, and I, I don't oftentimes do poems and prayers in, in my messages, but I found this one prayer, and I looked for the author, and it, it's anonymous. In fact, when I read it and got to the end of it, it says, an anonymous prayer by a dad. So I don't know who wrote it. But you know, it, it, was, it was pretty cool, and, and so the, the language is dated, so it must have been written years and years ago, but uh, it's still good, and I want you to listen to this dad's prayer, okay? Just listen. Dear God, my little boy of three has said his nightly prayer to thee. Before his eyes were closed in sleep, he asked that thou his soul would keep. And I still kneeling at his bed, my hand upon his tousled head, do ask with deep humility that thou, dear Lord, remember me. Make me kind, Lord, a worthy dad, that I may lead this little lad in pathways ever fair and bright, that I may keep his steps aright. O oh God, his trust, may ne his trust must never be destroyed or ever marred by me. So for the simple things he prayed with childish voice so unafraid, I trembly ask the same from thee, dear Lord, kind Lord, remember me. So how do you pray, Dad? There are 10 things I, I want to bring to you, and it won't take long, it's very brief, but you have the handout and you can follow along. First of all, Dad, be your child's teacher. We're familiar with Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It is your responsibility, Dad, to train up a child in the way that he should go. Not the school, not the church, not the Sunday school, not the children's directors, no. And it's not just dads, but moms also, you know. It's not just moms. And it's, not, it's, you know, most importantly, because God established it this way, it's you, Dad. It's you. Whether you have a, a child of your own or a stepchild, because we're living in this day now, folks. We're living in this day of single parenting, and then there's marriages, and and other marriages come together, and there's, there's kids from other marriages. We're living in this day and time, so no matter the situation you're in, it's your responsibility. God, God puts you in that responsibility now. So train up a child in the way they should go. Secondly, be an example to your children. 2 Corinthians 3, the one that I just read to you, you are a letter written in our hearts. Can you imagine your children looking at you and saying, Dad, I'm reading you. 
And this letter of yours is written in my heart. Thirdly, provide for your family. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, But if anyone does not provide for his own family, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse. In fact, the King James makes it even harder. Makes it, <laughs> it just kind of hits us between the eyes as worse than an infidel. Don't count on the state to provide for your family. You, Dad, you, Dad, take the responsibility to meet the needs of your family. If you're struggling to find work, then keep trying. Paul's talking more about your heart than anything else. I realize that. But as dads, it's our responsibility to make sure that our family needs are met. Dad, look for ways to give your family what they need before you take care of your own needs. Dad, before you take care of your needs and your own wants, take care of the needs of your family first. That's your responsibility. I'm not bragging this morning, but there were times when I worked three jobs because we had the small children in our home, unloaded boxcars, painted sewing machine equipment, worked in a mobile home factory. My father-in-law paid me one of the highest compliments that I've ever received. Marilyn's grandfather made some comment, and my father-in-law stood up and said, the one thing I don't have to worry about him is that he's always going to take care of his family made this son-in-law feel pretty good. Number four, good dads discipline their children. Now, you know, hang on to your seats. You got your seatbelt on. <laughs> Strap it on very tightly. Keep your arms and legs in on this ride with this point. Okay, you ready for this? Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. He who withholds his rod hates his child, but he who loves his child disciplines him diligently. Now listen, I'm privileged to work with the sheriff's department for 17 years. I've been privileged to be a chaplain. When I teach in the school of ministry, I teach a class entitled Ministerial Practicum. One of the segments in this ministerial practicum class that I've developed is about mandated reporting. And typically I'll invite a deputy to come in and make this presentation to these biblical credentialing students. In fact, this next week, Sergeant Jay Galt is going to come and make the presentation in Irvine when I teach next weekend in Irvine. And, and Jay, Sergeant Galt, has put together a PowerPoint. Sandra Slauson has also taught in this class. And they talk about child abuse because they both have worked with the child abuse department within our sheriff's department. And they make this presentation and it's very vivid. Corporal punishment defined according to the law, which is PCS 1165.4, any person who willfully inflicts upon any child any cruel or inhumane corporal punishment or injury resulting in a traumatic condition is considered to be child abuse. But that does not exclude, and, and this goes on in this law, it says this, this does not include an amount of force that is reasonable and necessary. How many would you agree that sometimes force is necessary? That does not mean that you can't spank your child, but you just better not leave a mark or a bruise. That's the law. Those who love their children is very careful about discipline. As far as I'm concerned, the biblical passage rings true that a person who abuses the child, it's, it's better for him to have a millstone around his neck and be drugged into the depths of the sea. That's God's view of child abuse. But as far as discipline is concerned, that's in order too. But here's what I'd like to say about that. Let's be proactive as parents. Let's lead in our home and let's lead our children to do the right things. And let the punishment fit the crime. Number five, dad, spend time with your child. And it's not selfish time. In Deuteronomy chapter six, these words which I've commanded you today shall be on your heart, dads. You should teach them diligently to your sons. That means spending time with them. 
Talk with them. Talk with them when you sit in your house. Talk with them when you walk with them by the way. Talk with them when they lie down at night and when they rise up in the morning. Dad, turn around and look who's following you. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Dad, spend time with your child. Engage your children. I, you know, I, <laughs> we're living in this technological age, right? I mean, we really are. I mean, my grandkids and you know, there's sometimes, you know, my wife and I will go out to eat at a restaurant or something. We'll say, let's put down our cell phones and not do the Facebooking and the texting and all this kind of stuff so we can just talk together as a, as a couple. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Same way, with our, same way with our children, right? You know, it's like, you know, put it down so that we can spend time together, but, but, but have them put it down with something else in mind. You know, I even ask my grandkids at times, hey, guys, you know, let's, let's get together and do something. Let's play a game. Put out our phones. Let's play a game. So if you say put down that cell phone or quit playing that game, have a plan. Have a plan to spend enjoyable time with that child. Have a plan. Make putting down the cell phone count for something. L let it have something that they can look forward to. And you'd be surprised how many times after all, you know, most of the time it's just bugging us and just putting it down is more about us than it is about them. And I've come to realize that even with my own grandkids. Number six, make compassion your best dad trait. Make compassion your best dad trait. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, be kind to one another. This applies to us dads. Be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Be a compassionate, loving, and forgiving father. Be tender-hearted as a father, just as you have received forgiveness from Christ. You know, I, I told the story in the early service this morning, kind of a funny story. I, I love my granddad. I love my granddad. I, 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 I got his name. I bear my granddad's name. I bear my father's name. There was a time when I didn't really like my name so much, but boy, I've come to really like my name. My name is Charles Lewis Maddox III. My father was junior. My, our oldest son is the fourth. I wrote in a card recently to our grandson. I said to my grandson, I said, you bear my name. You bear the name of your father. You bear the name of your great-grandfather. You bear the name of your great-great-grandfather. People make up their mind of the kind of family they are by the name that you have. Your name is Charles Lewis Matt Chaz Maddox V. You bear my name. I remember when we, we became pregnant with our oldest son, Charlie, when Marilyn became pregnant. It was in April. My, grand, my granddad had fallen and broken his hip, and he was in the hospital in Cleveland, Oklahoma. They lived in Osage, a little town called Osage. And so we drove to Cleveland to see my granddad. He was laying there in the hospital bed. He was in a lot of pain. They hadn't done surgery yet, and he was in a lot of pain. He was laying there, <laughs> a little bitty old short guy. His sense of humor, my granddad had the funniest. He was just the funniest guy. He was just hilarious. I always had a story to tell. And I remember walking up to his bedside, and he was just looking straight up at the ceiling, and I leaned over, and I said, Granddad, I said, we're going to have a baby. He was silent, then he turned his head and looked at me, and he said, it's all your fault. <laughs> well, he got that right, you know. And I'm standing looking at him, and then here's what he said to me. I've never forgotten it. He said, sometimes you just have to turn the other way. Just let that settle in when it comes to raising your children. Be kind. 
Be tenderhearted. Be forgiving. It's not always about you, Dad. Number seven, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> kind of harsh, isn't it? Well, maybe it's not those exact words, but James gives us a clue. James chapter 1 and verse 22, prove yourself to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. Become the real deal. Become the authentic man of God. Don't, don't just be a hearer of the word and not do anything with it. Turn around, Dad. Look at who's following you. You know, dads, we, we were living in a day and a time when, when boys, you know, it's, it's, all, it's about fashion, it's about shoes, it's about stuff, 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 that game console, all these kinds of things. But you know what? I, I, I could probably be pretty sure of this. You know, as your kids get older, maybe at the time when they leave home, and you talk to them, and I think I'm pretty sure about this. I, it may not be in every case. But if you ask them what they remember most about their growing up, you know, they're probably going to talk about the time that you, when you spent time with them. Not the things that you bought them. I mean, the shoes are going to wear out, the, the fashion jeans are going to, you know, we're going to grow out of them and they're going to be discarded and all those kinds of things. And I'm not saying those things aren't important, but, you know, sometimes the things that we think important are not... It's, the things that we think are necessary are not always the important. Did you catch that? The things that we think are necessary are not always the most important. Now, granted, there are things that we do remember that mean a lot to us. I remember my first baseball cleats. Remember, any guys remember your first baseball? I still got my, I still got my pair of my first baseball cleats. I got them home that day. Man, I put them on and I ran around. I love to hear them clicking on the concrete. You know, <laughs> ran up down the street, click, 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 click. I was proud of those baseball cleats. I still got them. Still got my first baseball glove. But the times that I remember that stand out to me the most is the times that my father and I would go out and do things together. Go down to the river and do some plinking with the rifle and the pistol. Times that we went to the Tulsa Order baseball games and sat behind home plate and ate peanut, roasted peanuts and drank pop. Man, times that I could see my father in the stands while I was playing ball and I could hear him above everybody else hollering, come on, rag arm, <laughs> that was my nickname. Turn around, Dad. Look at who's following you. What are your kids going to remember most about you? Let me tell you this, too. Once a dad, always a dad. You never stop being a father. Maybe I told you the story. I worked for a pastor by the name of Ray Thomas. And he's a great preacher, great pastor. His son came to visit on vacation one time, and he came into my office. I was a associate pastor at the time and he came and we were talking and and i talked to him as kind of telling stories and talked to him about taking the boys up to oak creek canyon there outside of sedona and we went trout fishing and then we'd get tired of fishing we'd jump in the creek and swim we just you know and and we did, had a good time and take the boys up go fishing and we'd come back he looked at me and he said you know what my dad never took me fishing i didn't say anything he said, my dad was always busy at church. He always had a revival or meetings or he was all preaching somewhere else. And he's always been said, other, other, other kids, my friends' dads took me fishing. Dad seldom came to any of my sporting events, but my friends' dads came to my sporting events. And I thought, wow, you know, and I didn't say much. And so the craziest thing about this is, is that he left and went back home because he's pastoring his own church. He was already pastoring his own church at this particular time. So like father, like son kind of a deal. And so Pastor Thomas and I were talking one time and then we talked about me taking the boys up, going fishing and stuff, you know. And he looked at me and here's what he said. This is just days after Rusty had left. And he said, you know what? I never took my boy fishing. I looked at him and I said, you know what? Once a father, always a father. Once a dad, always a dad. Guess what? He came back the next year on vacation. 
He bought two fishing poles. They went up to Oak Creek Cannon. They went fishing. They came back home and had a cookout and cooked the trout that they'd caught and just had a big old time. I thought, wow. Prove yourself to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. Number eight, I got to move on. Don't provoke your children. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Don't provoke them to anger. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord and speak the truth to them in love. Number nine, never give up, dads, moms. Don't give up on your kids. We can discipline them. We can hold them accountable. But we must never, ever give up on them. God has given us, listen, God has given us this great opportunity, man, to mold and shape a life. And listen, all of you here in church, God has given all of us as a church family an opportunity to mold and shape these young lives that are up there. You, you see James and Sarah's little kids running around. It's like, man, you know, we, we have this incredible opportunity to show them what church is all alike, what, what it's all about. And to come in here can be a place of joy and excitement. They can't, like, yeah, I've heard kids say they, they just got to go to children's church or they've got to go to girls' ministries or they've got to go to Royal Rangers. Man, that does my heart good to hear kids that they've got to go. We're doing something right. So as a church, don't give up on the kids. Never, ever give up on them. God has given us this great, privilege of molding and shaping a young life number 10 and finally pray for your children you know seem like I'm telling some stories but I'll never forget even in my rebellious days as a teenager you know how we kids are they'll sit back there in the pew and they're you know that with an attitude sometimes they don't want to be there in church and but in those days, in those times, I'd watch my father get up from the pew and go down and kneel at an altar and pray. And I'd sit back there thinking, wow, wow. I remember one day walking past his bedroom. I came out of my bedroom and I walked past the bedroom. His door was shut and I, and I, heard, I heard talking and it was loud, but it was all mixed with tears. And I stopped at the bedroom door and it was my father. And my dad was praying, and he was crying. And you know what he was praying? He was praying for my mom, and he was calling my name and my sister's name in prayer behind the closed door of his bedroom. To this day, wow. Pray for your children. Let them hear you pray for them. Listen to King David's prayer as I close. This is the prayer that King David prayed for his son Solomon. Give, give my son Solomon, 1 Chronicles 29, give my son Solomon a perfect heart to keep your commandments. Wow, what a prayer. God, I'm, I'm asking you to keep my son Solomon, give him a perfect heart so that he will keep my commandments and your testimonies and your statutes. God, keep my son Solomon. Give him such a pure heart that he will do all of these, that he'll keep your commandments, that he'll keep your testimonies, that he'll keep your statutes. Oh, God, give my son this kind of heart and give him a heart to build the temple that I prepared to build for your honor and glory. What a prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 6. But you, man of God... You, Dad, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And above everything else, Pops, fight the good fight of faith. It's worth it. Make it your prayer to walk before the Lord. And walk in such a way that your children will know what Jesus means to you and what the church means to you. And someday, someday, maybe your children will grow up to be just like you. Maybe he or she, maybe your child will grow up to love 
their spouse just like you love your spouse. Maybe your child will grow up to love their children the way you love them. Maybe your children will grow up to be just like you. Come on, Dad. Turn around. And look who's following you. Let's bow together. How you doing, Dad? The wonderful thing about God is the love that he has for us. That even though we may blow it and we may make mistakes and there may be a long laundry list of mistakes that we've made, they can all be washed away by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And though it may take time and years to mend the fences and relationships, it can be done. It, it just depends on what we want to do. Sometimes, you know, it, it's not a matter of I can't do something, but it's more of a matter I won't do something. So I'm praying this morning, Lord, for every dad in this house, moms included, that this message will find its mark in our spirit. And that we, Lord, if, if need be, that we can just, you know, say I'm sorry. And then struggles, even time struggling, you know, trying, working to get it right. We can do it. I know, Lord, we can do it. For with you, Lord, all things are possible. And I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. So Lord, you know, we need you and we need your help to pull it off. We, we need you, Lord, to help us change. So Lord, all of us in this room this morning are feeling somewhat, perhaps even some heaviness about this message, but it doesn't need to end that way. It just doesn't need to end this way. We can walk out of this building feeling a release and feeling a joy and then also feeling the challenge to get better and to parent better, to love better. We can do it, Lord. I know we can. But it's got to begin at the foot of the cross. So, Lord, here we are. And I'm just asking that you'll do with us whatever you want to do with us. You know, just, just whatever. And help us to get it right. Now, folks, with your heads bowed and, and nobody's looking around, I, this is the kind of message that, yes, I would invite you to come to an altar of prayer. And if you'd like to do that, boy, do it. I mean, don't hold back, don't hesitate. But right now, just in this moment, if you'll cooperate with me, just every head bound, nobody, I'm not even looking, I am not gonna look. But just as, as kind of a, a manly thing to do, just as like, you know, yeah. I'm just gonna put it out there, I'm just gonna get it out there, and, and I'm just gonna say to God, I need your help. I wonder, Dad, if you would be willing just to raise your hand toward heaven and say, God, I need your help. I'm not looking. I don't want anybody else looking around. This is between you and God. It's between me and God. And just raise your hand and say, yeah. You know, I know I'm not a perfect dad, but I want to I want, I want change. You just raise your hand this morning to heaven and just say, God, yeah, help me. Heavenly Father, you know the hands that have been raised here this morning. You have an all-seeing eye. As the psalmist said, you're intimately acquainted with all of our ways, so you've, you've seen these hands being raised, and you, you know the heart of every dad in this room, every husband in this room. 
As we leave this place this morning, may we accept the full responsibility of fatherhood. And may we work to get it right, understanding that we have been given this incredible privilege to shape and mold a tender heart and a tender life. God, I just pray that you will will constantly remind us of this. The joy of parenting, the joy of fatherhood, to have those children wrap their arms around us. And really, no matter the age, even even as our children grow up and leave home, to, to, to come home again and give us a hug and the grandkids to come and run and leap in our arms. Father, there's nothing, there's nothing that compares to that. But Lord, we're laying the foundation for that. The foundation's being laid by the way that we treat our children. So Father, as we leave this place this morning, continue to do the work in each of us to make us more like you and to love our kids. Don't let anybody else love them like we're going to love them. I pray that in your precious and powerful name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, I hope that you can say it's been good to be in God's house. This is, as I mentioned to begin with, this message is, is somewhat different. And I'm serious when I say a hopefully convicting that we can see some changes in our own lives by the way that we treat our kids and our companions, even our church. Amen? You okay? Everybody all right? Let's stand together. God bless you. Shake at least three hands before you leave and say, man, it's been good to be in God's house this morning. Go out and build some memories today because you never know what a day is going to bring. So make this day special for all the dads, okay? God bless you.